It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4 verse 8. Galatians 4 8. Here we begin a study of the fact that the greatest enemy to grace is religion and legalism. The greatest enemy to grace religion and legalism. Formerly when, as unbelievers, you did not know God. Formerly when, as unbelievers, you did not know God. Now the Greek word used here means that the only way to come to know God is through having doctrine circulating in your stream of consciousness. You cannot get closer to God apart from learning the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says we must have the thinking of Christ. And no one can know the Lord until you know His Word. And there's nothing concerning drawing close to God that has to do with emotion. An emotional experience does not get you closer to God. So you cannot even know God and know the Lord until you believe in Christ. The unbeliever is said to be sukikos, which is soulish dichotomous, having only a soul and body. We receive a human spirit at the moment we believe in Christ. So those who are soulish, as were the Galatians at this point, that means they have no way without the Holy Spirit guiding them into an understanding of how to be saved. There's no way they can understand spiritual matters, and they looked at spiritual matters as foolishness, because these spiritual things are learned by the Spirit. So formerly, when as unbelievers you did not know God, you were enslaved. Now Satan himself was behind all of the idolatry that enslaved them. And behind every idol that they had in Galatia was demonism. And it was loaded with demonism. And today, in any part of the world where there's lots of polytheism, lots of idols that people worship, behind all of that is demonism. And the Galatians were enslaved to this demonism. So you were enslaved to beings that by nature are not gods at all. So these Galatians, before they were saved, they worshipped heathen gods, they, which are, of course, no gods at all. And in fact, when Paul and Barnabas arrived, they took one look at Barnabas, who was more handsome than Paul, and they called him Zeus. And they thought that Barnabas was Zeus, a god, one of the gods they worshipped. And then they took one look at Paul, who was ugly, and they called him Mercury. And since Paul was ugly, they worshipped Paul as Mercury because Mercury means that he would be the messenger for a god because they were interested in what Paul had to say, but it was very difficult to look at Paul, and there's other reasons why it was difficult to look at Paul at this point. Acts 14:10 through 13 tells the story of Paul's visit to the Galatians. Now under the excellent teaching of the Apostle Paul, they finally broke free from their heathenism and they were no longer in bondage under these false gods. But what they've done by going toward legalism is they've left one trap and they've gone right into another trap. They thought they could be saved by worshiping many gods. Then they found out from Paul, well, it's faith alone in Christ alone. And then they were freed from that bondage. And now they've gone straight back into bondage by believing the Judaizers. It would be uh, tantamount to a homeless person moving from, from one bridge to another. No improvement. You've just moved from one bridge, living under one bridge. Now you're going to go live under another bridge. You went from following false gods to now following legalism. Now in Galatians 4, 9. But... But here in the Greek is a conjunction of contrast. But now that you have come to know God by experience, that means that they have accepted Christ as their Savior 
and they've had a pretty good start in learning the Word of God. But now that you have come to know God by experience and had a good start in doctrine and are known by God, what this means they were known by God is that God knew billions of years ago who would accept Jesus Christ and who would not accept Jesus Christ. But now they've decided that they're going to save themselves even after they've already been saved. So they've left the idea of eternal security. And now they're going to uh, say to uh, the Judaizers are going to come down and they're going to say, you must be circumcised. You must go through certain spiritual rites. You must follow the Sabbath. You must follow other religious feasts. You must follow all types of activities to pretend to be spiritual. And that's what the Judaizers have been telling uh, the Galatians. But now that you have come to know God by experience, faith alone in Christ alone, and are known by God, how can you be in the process, this is a corrected translation of Galatians 4.9, how can you be in the process of turning again to weak and worthless basic forces that you keep lusting to be enslaved again. They actually keep lusting to be enslaved again. They went from being enslaved to idols to now being enslaved to legalism. Tithe, brothers, tithe. Uh, follow the law, follow the Sabbath, etc. Now there's no power for the Galatians to provide capital, riches, or wealth in Judaism. And Judaism is called weak because Judaism cannot save, neither can any other religion. And it's called worthless because it cannot produce blessing in time. So we have these two words. How can you be in the process of turning again to the weak and worthless? So there's no power for the Galatians to provide any capital, riches, or wealth in Judaism. So it is weak and it is worthless. How could you from your own free will now go from grace to legalism? How could you go from freedom and then back to slavery? Well, people do it all the time. And sometimes people actually lust for slavery. One of the greatest examples of that in history is when the Exodus generation lusted to go back to Egypt. They had been freed from Egypt. They were living under freedom. And in fact, they had now been given the Mosaic Law, which provided them a great deal of human freedom. And now they want to go back to Egypt. Well, the Galatians were freed. They were saved by faith alone in Christ alone. They were freed from any types of works, including the works of the law. But now they've decided to be enslaved again. And it actually says they lust to be in slavery. This means that their volition was based on emotions. They had gone into emotional revolt of the soul because they had rejected the greatest Bible teacher of all times, the Apostle Paul. And when you reject great Bible teaching, inevitably you will immediately move toward emotional revolt of the soul. And some people live their lives by their emotion and therefore when their emotion desires uh, something other than uh, what is normal from a thought pattern of freedom, they go straight toward slavery. So emotionally they want to go back to slavery <laughs> just as the Exodus generation wanted to go back to Egypt. So when you get under religion, you're a sucker. And what Paul's telling them, you were a sucker when you worshipped all those gods. You were a sucker when you worshipped uh, Zeus and when you worshipped Mercury. And now you were saved, you were no longer a sucker. But now that you have gone back in for legalism and now you're following another religion called Judaism, you're a sucker all over again. He's really laying it on hard and thick for them. And 1 Corinthians 2.16 again says we must have the thinking of Christ and no one can come to know the Lord apart from learning the Word of God. And the Galatians have departed from the Word of God. They've departed from grace and now they're going straight in for legalism. And again, there's no drawing close to the Lord through any type of emotional experience. And that's the way most people think they get close to God. Feel sorry for their sins. Emotion. Get emotional and have joy in the Lord. Get emotional this and get emotional that. Now Galatians 4.10. Galatians 4.10. You are turning to the process of beginning to observe you have the days. You are turning to the process of beginning to observe the days. What are these days? Sabbath. 
And in fact, this comes out in Colossians as well. You are turning to the process of beginning to observe the days, the Sabbath, and the months, and the seasons, and times, and years. Now, people today follow the Sabbath. What's that? That's following a day. And they've turned back to that. That was for Israel. And now the Galatians say we must go to the Sabbath. And of course, they thought of going to the Sabbath as on Saturday. Christians today have said, well, we'll just make it a Christian holiday, Sunday, which is not the Sabbath to start with. But people are keeping the Sabbath today, and that's one of the worst rat races in all of legalism. And if one of your next-door neighbors is a legalist and catches you mowing the lawn, they'll throw their nose way up in the air and say, I would never mow my lawn on the Lord's day. They're following days. They're doing exactly what the Apostle Paul says not to do. So they don't even know the Bible. They don't know Galatians. Probably never even read it. And if they did read it, they would still be ignorant. So people are keeping the Sabbath today. And of course, Sunday is the first day of the week. It is an assembly worship day, but so is every other day. Saturday here is not, and Saturday is the Sabbath. Think about that for a moment. So people who think you can't do this or you can't do that on the Sabbath, people who think you can't play baseball or go hunting or do some type of activity on the Sabbath know nothing about the post-salvation spiritual life. They don't know that the spiritual life is being filled with the Spirit. They think it's something that they do or something that they abstain from. God is not impressed when you stay home on the Sabbath and twiddle your thumbs. God is not impressed because you don't go outside and start up that lawnmower. You think that impresses God? You have a weird idea of who God is if you think that impresses Him. The law was made for us, by the way, made for Israel, not for us. But when the law was made for Israel, it was made for their benefit, not God's benefit. So it does not benefit God at all for you to follow a Sabbath or a special day. So don't try to make some special day out of Sunday. And if you're Seventh-day Adventist, don't try to make some special day out of Saturday. It's not Christianity to make a special day out of the Sabbath. So don't fall into that trap. And if you are falling into that trap, you're being like a stupid, stupid, stupid Galatian. So don't fall into that trap. Go ahead and start up your lawnmower. Go ahead and run around and play your football games. Go ahead and do your Sunday barbecue, all of which is legitimate. It also talks about feasts, and there were bona fide feasts in the Jewish age, but not anymore. Do we follow the Passover? Well, if we were to follow the law, we would. We don't follow the Passover. We don't follow the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. We don't follow the Feast of the Trumpets. We don't follow the Feast of Atonements. We don't follow the Feast of the Tabernacles. But if we were following the law completely, we sure would. So what's the big deal about following Sunday, which isn't even the Sabbath? Tell you what it is. In addition, a distraction from Satan himself to distract you from the filling of the Spirit as the basis for your spiritual life. You must be filled with the Spirit to be spiritual. And you can be filled with the Spirit every day of the week, whether you're working or twiddling your thumbs. doesn't matter. Also, as part of the Mosaic Law, do you know what they did? They worked for six years, and on the seventh year, everybody had a one-year vacation. I like that. I'd like to follow that part of the law. But that's what the people did. They would work for six years and then have a seventh year vacation. And then after, and then that's the sabbatical year. And then after every 50th year, everything that you had bought and purchased would go back to its original owner. Now that would work out a bit weird today, but that's the way they did it back then. And that was simply a teaching tool to show grace. And you might have accumulated a lot of wealth, accumulated a lot of property. Too bad it goes back to its owner on the uh, 50th year. So now in Galatians 4.11. Galatians 4.11. Now as an introduction to 4.11, Apostle Paul has been studying his butt off trying to teach these people that it's faith alone and Christ alone. He's He's been trying to teach them grace and as soon as he goes out on another mission somewhere else, they get sidetracked by following Sabbaths and everything else. So in 4.11 he says, I am afraid for you that my labor, 
to the point of exhaustion for you. Apostle Paul studied and studied and studied and studied. studied. He would study and teach, study and teach, study and teach, study and teach, and now he's worried that all of that studying and teaching may have been in vain. I am afraid for you that my labor to the point of exhaustion for you may have been in vain. He spent a lot of time in the Galatian church at first, and now he's afraid that everything that he's laid as a foundation of doctrine has been in vain because the first thing they do as soon as Paul leaves, they go straight back to the Oakwood Baptist Church. And they start tithing again. And they start playing games again. And they start doing silly stuff. So he spent all this time with the Galatians and now he's afraid, man, maybe I should have just never even bothered. And this is always an occupational hazard with a pastor. You think you want the gift of pastor teacher? You have an occupational hazard. People get stupid. And they want to hop away. That's I mean it's the truth. People get stupid and they want to hop back to legalism, especially where it's so prevalent. So Apostle Paul would labor to the point of exhaustion, meaning he studied hard and he in fact studied harder than any of all the others in that day. Studied very hard. So in modern terms, uh if you think about the Apostle Paul, he'd be studying and fall asleep at his computer or something like that. So oftentimes a good minister will get the idea that all of his study has been in vain because the congregation isn't responsive. And the Galatians have not been responsive. They were responsive at first, but now here come the legalists and they get sidetracked. So the greatest enemy you have is that constant temptation to become a legalist. And it is a constant temptation, especially in this country and in this area. The greatest enemy you have is not a constant temptation of sexual lust. It's a constant temptation of going in for legalism because that deals with your thinking. And once your thinking goes AWOL from grace, it takes a long time to get back. So what happens under legalism? You try to work through the energy of the flesh to be spiritual. You think you're spiritual because you get emotional and that's emotional revolt of the soul. <coughs> So the greatest enemy, again, is legalism, the temptation to become legalistic. And many people think they're spiritual because of asceticism. Asceticism is giving up something. The Catholics do this. Well, on Tuesday, on Mardi Gras, they go crazy and get drunk and do drugs and everything else. Then on Wednesday, they put a dot of ash on their head and give up something and think that's spiritual. And they have to give up that something for 40 days. Now, if it's good to give up something for 40 days, why don't you give it up all the time? You see, religion and legalism doesn't even make any sense. It doesn't even add up if you're a logically thinking person. But the thing about legalism is it always incorporates the emotional revolt of the soul and emotion is not rational. And that's why they go in for this irrational type of thinking. Now what makes you spiritual again is the filling of God the Holy Spirit. That's what makes you spiritual. Nothing else. Being filled with the Spirit as an absolute makes you spiritual. You name your sins to God, you are spiritual. Now let's look at Galatians 4.12. Galatians 4.12. Royal family, dealing with believers. Royal family, I keep begging you. This is middle voice in the Greek, which means he keeps begging them for their benefit. I keep begging you to keep on becoming as I and I as you. Now we'll study that part of the verse first. Royal family, I keep begging you to keep on becoming as I and I as you. In other words, don't change. You started in grace, continue in grace. The moment you believed in Christ, you received 39 irrevocable absolutes. You received two power options, three spiritual skills, four spiritual mechanics, the three adult stages of the spiritual life, the ten problem-solving devices. You've received all of these things. So now that you've started in grace with all of these wonderful things, why depart from it? Why go off the reservation? Everything was provided for you in salvation and everything has been provided for your post-salvation experience. So why are you going now in for legalism? After having all of these things given to you, why are you now following a Sabbath? You've been given the filling of the Spirit and you're following a Sabbath that doesn't add up. 
So Christ did everything on the cross, of course. He propitiated God the Father. He provided redemption. He provided regeneration. He provided the imputation of the righteousness of God. He did all the work. So now why are you changing and trying to work your way into heaven on the one hand or trying to become spiritual through your own works when it's all been provided by God? Why do it? Because you're stupid. Not you, but the Galatians is what Paul was saying. Because you Galatians are stupid. That's why you've gone in for energy of the flesh. Then he goes on to say, well, let's continue with the royal family. I keep begging you to keep on becoming as I and I as you. What he's saying is since you were saved by grace, why do you think now that you don't have to live by grace? If you were saved by grace, many people believe that. Why are you trying to work now? If you're saved by grace, logically it follows that you should live by grace. It's a simple question and a simple answer that most believers cannot answer today. And that means we're in trouble as a country. We're not in trouble because of politicians, but because believers have been seduced by legalism. And boy, have they ever been seduced by legalism. You can see it on all the signs going up and down uh, 24 or 28, whatever road you want to go down, 85. All these signs in front of these churches make absolutely no sense on the one hand. And when they do make a point, it's usually a legalistic point. Every now and then they'll get something right. But then on the other side of the sign, it's something totally opposite. No logic. That's because the preacher and all the congregations in emotional revolt. So they've gotten into a religious trap. And now they've, uh, first of all, the Galatians got into a religious trap by following God's. Now they've gotten into another religious trap by following Judaism. So then Paul has to add this. You have not injured me at all. Now this is simply a... Well, it's, it's not really what it means. It's, it, you have not injured me at all. What he's saying, it's an idiom. You have not injured me at all means I am not the issue, Galatians. What happened was the Judaizers came down and made Paul the issue. And so he looks at them and says, I'm not the issue. It's not the man, it's the message is what he says. And what Paul is also saying is if you reject doctrine because you don't like a personality, there's something wrong with you because I'm not the issue. Personality's not the issue. The issue is, are you receiving grace teaching or not? If the answer is no, then of course you would be right to get out of such a church. If the answer is yes, you'd be wrong. Because the issue is not the communicator. The, the issue is what is the message. And the issue is not the personality. You know the Judaizers came down with a very sweet personality and we will note that in a moment straight from Galatians 4. Very sweet, very kind, patting people on the back, uh, encouraging them, as you would call it. When you, oh, they're encouraging them, all right. They're encouraging them in their own arrogance. And they're not going to grow up being encouraged. And the Judaizers would come along. I see that you and your family have been circumcised. Good for you, brother. Then they would stare down their nose at somebody else and say, you see them over there? They haven't gotten circumcised yet. Why don't you go over there and nudge them and tell them to get circumcised? Then they would be pushed into being circumcised. And then the preacher and the Judaizer would go up and say, Well, good for you, brother. You were circumcised too. Everybody who's been circumcised, come forward. See how stupid it is? But it's just as stupid today. So what he's telling the Galatians, you haven't injured me at all. It's not me that's the issue anyway. It's not the issue of personality. And Paul says, you've not injured me at this point because of your apostasy. You're not hurting me. You're hurting yourself is what he's telling them. And even though Paul loved his congregation and it bothered him, it wasn't hurting him that they were going stupid because Paul wasn't going stupid. So people did personally attack Paul, but it was an attack on God's will. It was an attack on God's plan. It wasn't a pers it was they did make it a personal attack on Paul, and he was the focus of much gossip, but it wasn't Paul's fault. It was the fault of legalism creeping in. So now Paul makes a personal appeal in four thirteen. And actually it gets a slight bit sarcastic here, but it really makes sense. Galatians 4.13 
You know how, how as a result of my infirmity of the flesh, I first pro proclaim the gospel to you. You know how as a result of my infirmity of the flesh, I first proclaim the gospel to you. His infirmity of the flesh was eye trouble at this point. He had picked up an eye infection from some type of mosquito on his missionary journeys. And his eye would look horrendous. It probably became a, a yellow pus filled looking eyeballs. And he could barely see and it was agitating to him. And it was very, very ugly to look at. And Paul was very ugly to look at. So he says, uh, so he says, you know how as a result of my infirmity of the flesh, I first proclaimed the gospel to you. It got so bad he had to just stop here and start giving the gospel. And that's what he did, even in his infirmity, in his health problem. And Paul always had bad, bad health problems. So Paul realized that he wasn't going to cut any ice by his looks. When Paul, you see, what would we do? What do teenagers do when they break out in all kind of zits? They try to stay home. Or they try to, uh, they don't want to go out, they got to stay home and doctor the zits. Well, Paul didn't think that way. Paul knew he was ugly, but he knew he had a message. And Paul knew he wasn't going to cut any ice by his looks. And the acts of Paul and Thecla even described Paul as short, bald, pot belly, with a high, squeaky voice. So Paul realized he wasn't going to cut any ice with his looks, and he realized he was totally handicapped even in the speaking situation. But what was Paul's attitude? Paul got up and thought, well, the battle's the Lord's. I'm giving the gospel. I have a message. I've been ordained to be an apostle. And nobody's going to change that, not even my personality or my looks. And guess what? The Galatians accepted him at first. So, so Paul did not think in terms of talent. Paul thought in terms of God's provision. And Paul thought of himself as helpless, but he didn't care. He got up and did his job. And again, this is where we get the verse. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And God looked at the heart of the Apostle Paul and said, You teach it, brother, or son in this case. So man looks on the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. And when it comes to ladies choosing a man to be married, look at the content of the man's integrity. And the same goes for the man looking for a woman. Look for her integrity. See if she has any integrity because looks change over the years. And someone who's very beautiful at the age of 23 can be ugly as dirt by the time they reach 43. It happens. Or they could get in a car accident and really get mangled. And then you're left with an ugly person on the outside and inside. Look for integrity. And what did the Galatians do? They became superficial and they were taken away by flattery as many women get taken away by flattery and they never even look at the content of integrity. So for the believer who loves God, all things work together for good and that goes for illness. And in terms of the Apostle Paul's illness, it all worked together for good because it caused the Apostle Paul to stop long enough in Galatia to give them the gospel and a lot of people responded. So in that case, all things work together for good for Paul, even in, in his illness. Now in Galatians 4.14. Galatians 4.14 is also dealing with the fact that human viewpoint hinders grace. Human viewpoint hinders grace. And though my physical condition put you to the test, why did his physical condition put them to the test? Because he looked so ugly it was distracting. He was so ugly, most people would be repulsed by looking at the man. And though my physical condition put you to the test, you did not make light of my repulsive appearance or reject me, which means spit me out. Even though he was ugly, they didn't make light of it, they didn't make fun of him, and they didn't make fun of his repulsive appearance, and they didn't spit him out. Instead, you welcomed me as though I were a messenger of God, as though I were Jesus Christ. So that were positive. And when people are positive, it doesn't matter what the messenger looks like, doesn't matter even what he sounds like. If he's giving a correct message, people will respond. If people are superficial, then they're negative. 
and stupid. So uh, they originally thought Paul was Hermes or Mercury. And this is when Paul first landed in Galatia, they said, well, this is Mercury. Why? Because he was giving them a message. Now, he didn't speak it very eloquently, but it was a message they'd never heard before and they were receptive to it. So they said, well, this must be Mercury coming from one of the gods to give us a message. And Mercury, by the way, was one of the least of the good-looking gods. Hermes is considered a messenger. So they received Paul at first as one of their false gods. And he was received to them as the god of speech because he had a good message. And again, Barnabas was received as Zeus because apparently Barnabas, Paul's sidekick, was very good looking. And Zeus was the best looking of the gods. So they looked at Barnabas and said, there's Zeus. And they looked at Paul and said, he's ugly, but he's got a message. There's Mercury. So the real good public speakers were the Judaizers, however. And in terms of talent, the Judaizers had a lot of talent in terms of public speaking. And the Judaizers would add some spice to their speech. All you have to do is watch Channel 6 and note that people who don't have much to say have to add some spice to their speech to make it entertaining. And one message I saw, the man said for about five minutes, You're going to rise up! (laughs) You're going to rise up! (laughs) And people are like, Yeah! What are you saying? We don't know, but it sounds really good. But see, Paul didn't use any of that. Paul didn't use any entertainment. We could have this place overflow and get an organ in here and let me add some spice to it. But I'm not going to do that. That's, that's non-biblical. And so just watch Channel 6 every now and then, but don't get a sway by them. But just look at it for a second and say, well, that's just the way it is. Add a little spice to your language. Get a little emotional tinge with your speech. Throw in a few gimmicks and everything will work out. And that's what happened. Judaizers came down. So the overriding principle to all this is uh, in terms of promotional ability, this is what people do. And this is what the Judaizers do. It was as if on uh, their worship day they would hand out candy, have a fun time, and do all kind of junk that goes against the Word of God. Or they might not even go against it, but they just don't teach the Word of God. But it's a way of entertaining. It's a way of uh, uh, scratching one's back in order to get them to be led astray. And we have this great hindrance today, the idea that you can't draw people unless you have a dog and pony show. It might be true that you cannot, but in those cases where it is true, it just means there's negative volition. And the Galatians were getting led astray by a dog and pony show. And they do it today, you know, bring somebody up who can play the trumpet and piano and drums at the same time and have some musical freak do something, and then uh, here come the people to watch this musical freak. But that's not the way it should be. What is the message of the Word of God? Not what is all this human talent all about. And this is all human viewpoint, and the Galatians had gone in for human viewpoint instead of relying on divine provision. So churches today are legalistic and they go in for gimmicks. And many of those churches are called Baptist. But let me tell you something about John the Baptist. Where was he? In the middle of a desert. Did he have any gimmick? No. We studied part of John the Baptist in Matthew. What did he do? He chewed out people constantly. Yet people came and believed and were baptized as part of the ceremony. And Paul and the, um, John the Baptist didn't use any gimmick. And guess what? Uh, John the Baptist stuck with the Word. And did Paul use any gimmicks? Absolutely not. He simply stuck to the Word of God. And it was the Apostle Paul who turned the world upside down, not the Judaizers. What happened to the Judaizers? Fifth cycle of discipline. The Roman army came in, starved them out, and killed them. Why? Because they got into gimmicks. Paul did not. And Paul turned the world upside down. And you can turn the world upside down, but it depends on your attitude toward the Word of God. So then in Galatians 4.15. Galatians 4.15. Where then is your blessing? Your blessing was gone when you went into legalism. 
Where then is your blessing? They went into legalism and they should know now there's no blessing in it. That was the end of their blessing. When they went in for legalism, they became fickle. And they became fickle in that they, start, that in that they started in grace, but now they're going in for legalism. And now they no longer listen to a message of doctrine because they're too busy working for spirituality rather than simply being filled with the Spirit. And why are these people fickle? Well, they first loved Paul, now they hate Paul. They first loved him, now they hate his guts. So where then is your blessing? For I stand as a witness that if possible, it's not, but if it were, I stand as a witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. You see, he had this eye disease. And they loved his message so much and responded to the word of God so much that they felt sorry enough for him that if they could, they would have plucked out their own eyes and gave it to Paul so he could go on in his ministry. What's happened now? Fickleness. Now they would rather see him dead than to give him their eyes. What makes people so fickle? Go from love to hate, love to hate, like that. And love is not related to hate. I know psychologists will say love and hate is closely related. That's because they only look at love and hate as emotion. Love is a system of thinking. And hate is a system of thinking too. And they are total opposite. They are antonyms in the English language and they should be. They're not synonyms. And it just so shows fickleness. So now in Galatians 4.16... So then, have I become your enemy because I keep on telling you the truth? So then, have I become your enemy because I keep on telling you the truth? Answer, yes. They did become his enemy. Now they're going to turn around because he gets tough with them. He's going to lay it on the line. And he says, formerly, you would have pulled out your very own eyeballs and given them to me. It's a very dramatic picture. But now I'm your enemy, and now you wish to pull out my larynx so I'll shut up. And that's what he's saying to him. So people who look at life in a superficial manner see love as an emotion. And they see hate as an emotion. And they say these things are closely related, and they are not. True love is a mental attitude. And we've studied true love enough to where you should know what it's all about. True love is a mental attitude. And the reason why Christians are getting divorced left and right is because they are in in unstable, they are ignorant, they lack application of doctrine, they have no capacity for true love, and therefore it is important to be loved by God than to be loved by people. And what has happened is people have become fickle because they want to be loved by people. But people change all the time. So it's more important to be loved by God than to be loved by people. Though that's difficult to understand because we can't see God, but we can see people. And so when people get on our nerves, we hate them. And when people treat us kindly, we, as it were, love them. But we have to get to a point where we have a true love for God. And we can have that because God is perfect. God is love. And 1 John 4.19 says God, we love because God first loved us. So why do people hop from marriage to marriage? They don't understand true love. Why do people hop from church to church? They don't understand true love either. So there are many successful pastors out there because they know how to stroke people's egos and that's what they get paid for. They don't get paid for teaching the Word. They get paid for Stroking egos and it's flattery, flattery, flattery. I'll flatter you to keep you here. And flattery is the greatest enemy of grace. And when you do things as unto people, you're not doing things as unto God. That's why I'm not going to spend time flattering you. Whether you deserve it or not, you're supposed to be listening to the word as unto the Lord, not unto me. You're supposed to be doing things as unto the Lord, not unto others. Yet flattery comes along and a pastor will pat you on the back and say, I noticed you did this for the church. Mmm, those were some good biscuits. Thank you, sister, for making them biscuits this morning. Those are the best biscuits I ever made. And by the way, they were better than my wives. And they're the best, well, you know. And uh, they'll really get their ego. And then guess what? 
up, up pops the purse and here comes some money in the collection plate. Thank you for flattering me. I'll pay for that flattery. And this is the nonsense that's going on today. And that's what happened to the Galatian church. And in fact, in the Galatian church, they even got to a point where these legalists who had come down said, you know, Paul, he didn't charge for his message because it wasn't worth charging for. Now, you're going to have to pay for what we're giving you. You're going to have to pay for this entertainment. In fact, in the book of Malachi, it tells you you must give your tithes and offerings. And the more offerings you give to me, the greater blessing God will pour upon you because I'm like that with God. That's what they'll say. And it's the same way today. And people do the same things today. And flattery is the fastest way to get people to uh, do things like this. So the Galatians had no clue about faith, hope, and love. No clue about it. The Apostle Paul started to teach them about faith, hope, and love, but they didn't have a clue about it. They, they had forgotten what the faith rest drill was. They had no confidence that they were saved. They thought they had to work for it. That's what hope is, help is. And they had no idea about love because they went in for flattery. And you ladies, because you're, you are responders, go in for, for flattery as well. Men do it too, of course. Uh, but you ladies go in for it a bit more because you were designed as a responder. And as soon as a man starts flattering you, you might think, my husband doesn't flatter me this way. Just remember when you were dating, I bet he did. You're just married now. And things that he shouldn't have to flatter you every day. He's not there to entertain you. And somebody comes along with a bright smile and knows how to flatter you, and you'll be taken away just like the Galatians. And guess where you will end up? You'll end up just like the Galatians. In misery! 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 Another thing that the uh, manipulators in uh, uh, of the Judaizers would do, they would come down and manipulate. They would come down and put people through a guilt trip. You haven't been circumcised. I noticed you haven't been following the Sabbath. I've noticed this and that. And they would even form groups that would say, "You, uh, these groups, they even have them today. It's the most disgusting thing I've ever heard of. I heard of one in a college group. They have these college groups everywhere. You join some Christian college group and they'll get in there and they'll say, well, we have this band of uh, brothers or sisters. Usually all the girls get together and all the boys get together. And we have these bands of sisters and we share with each other our weaknesses. And when we start to go in for one of those weaknesses, we go for help from one of our sisters. And that's what they do. And they don't rely on God. They rely on each other. It happens today all across this country. And it's nonsense. You won't get to maturity that way. You get to maturity by being filled with the Spirit and learning the Word of God. And so what do they use? They use manipulation, also called a guilt complex. And the Judaizers used a guilt complex. Made you feel guilty because you didn't do this and you didn't do that. And anyone who puts a guilt complex on anyone else is evil, evil, evil. Absolutely evil. I saw a sign on the way up today. I can't remember what it said exactly. Something about uh, if you do not uh, raise your children in a godly manner, you're rep reprehensible. I'll tell you what's reprehensible. Turning God into an adverb. That's reprehensible. Godly. God's not an adverb. But they're so stupid they probably don't even know what an adverb is. But anyway, that's, that's manipulation by guilt, by the way. And they want you to raise your children their way, the legalistic way. And that's not the way. So guilt complex. And the Galatians became suckers for this guilt complex. So now in 417, we have flattery and how flattery hinders grace. And it says they, who are they? Legalistic Jews. They, legalistic Jews, keep zealously courting you, but not honestly. What's this mean? This means they're being told how good they are, how good they're doing, how nice it is that they're getting circumcised now, how righteous they've become since they've left Paul. Before they left Paul, they were terrible people. Now they've left Paul, they've become righteous, great people. 
And it's all a lie. And they would be patted on the back and they, the uh, Judaizers would pour out flattery all over them. So they keep zealously courting you, but not honestly. They're not even telling you the truth in all this. They want to separate you so that they might affect you. The true Greek word is separate. Separate from who? Paul. They want to separate you from Paul's grace teaching so that they might affect you. Now flattery goes a long way in some cases. If you're in a business, the best way to get your workers to work harder is not by being harsh on them, but by flattery. Best way is to uh, pull a, pull somebody into the into your office and say, "I've had bosses like this." Uh, pull you, pull them into your office and they'll say, uh, "Their office, my, you do such a good job. You're working really hard. You know, I think you work harder than everybody else. So you go out there and you keep doing such a good job. Just wanted to let you know that. And what are you going to do? Your ego is going to puff up. You're going to sit down at your desk and you're going to work harder than you had all day long." <laughs> And then while you're not looking, in comes somebody else. Hey, I need to talk to you privately. Come in here. I want to tell you what a good job you're doing. In fact, I think you're doing one of the best jobs here. Then they go out, sit down, and they work harder than they have all day. If, you have, if you're a manager with any sense, that's a better way to do it than to just get harsh on them. That is in the business world. But it doesn't work that way in Christianity. It might work that way in the business world in order to motivate people. But in Christianity it doesn't work that way because in Christianity it's for reproof, correction, and instruction. So flattery hinders grace. Now in Galatians 4.18. Now in 4.17 he says, These legalists have zealously courted you. Now in 4.18. However, it is good to be properly courted at all times and not only when I am present with you. We got a lot of information just out of this, uh, these couple, this one sentence. There's a lot of information out of this. First of all, there is a proper way to be courted. That is to be courted by grace. In terms of Christianity, it's good to be courted by grace. By way of application, ladies, it's good to be courted by your right man. It's awful to be courted by your wrong, by all these wrong paramours out there. You've been courted by a right man, married that right man, that was good. Now you're married and you're being courted by somebody else, that's not good. That's wrong. So there's a right, right way to be courted and a wrong way. And the right way in Christianity is grace, grace, grace. And the Apostle Paul is the right pastor for the Galatian church. Not these legalists who have come down from... Judea. And so not only should... Now let's look at the other half of the verse. It, should, it is good to be properly courted at all times and not only when I am present with you. And not only when I am present with you. So not only should you stick with grace when Paul is with them, but when Paul is going away on duty, should they stick with grace. By application today, what this means is when there is not face-to-face -face teaching available, and oftentimes it's not, when proper face-to-face -face teaching is not available, you better follow up by some other means of learning doctrine. And today we have more means of doing that than ever before. MP3, cassette, CD, internet, all sorts of ways to properly receive doctrine. There were ways by, back then, and what they would do back then is such as the Apostle Paul writing this letter. He would write the letter to the church. Then, one of the better speakers in the church, he didn't have the gift of apostle, probably not even the gift of pastor teacher, but was a good reader, and they would get up and read this Galatian epistle to the church. And that's how they got their information, non-face-to-face. So you might have been wondering, why do I harp on this non-face-to-face? Because the Bible does. And Paul said, look, even when I'm not around, you better keep getting it. Even when I'm not here, you better keep learning the Word. So there is legitimate teaching other than face-to-face -face teaching, according to the Word of God.
and the pastors that don't teach that, they're, go, they're putting a little yeast into the whole loaf because that's legalism to think that you have to get up and go to a place to learn it. I mean, if that were the case, I would have moved to Houston or something. So not only should you stick with grace when I am with you, but when I am going on duty. That's what he's saying. So the true manifestation of love from a pastor is that he's accurately teaching the Word of God to you. It is good to be properly courted at all times. And then some paramour comes along from uh, the Judaizers and tries to sway them into legalism and just from all that flattery swept them right off their feet. And they don't understand love. They don't understand that while Paul is being very harsh with them, he's doing it in absolute love. And the only way a pastor teacher can really show true love for a congregation is study and teach, study and teach, study and teach. I was up till 3 o'clock last night studying. And when I got up today, I began studying again. And usually I take a break and might watch some TV. And some nights I've just watched TV. And then in the day do it. But I'm going to stop all that going to be study all the time except Saturday and when it's really sunny I'll go swimming. But I'm going to increase my study quite a bit. Because that is, that is how a pastor shows love for his congregation. Not by flattery. Not by making you feel good. Sometimes you might walk out of here feeling like a piece of crap. Well, maybe that's what the Holy Spirit wanted you to assess for that moment. But don't have a guilt complex. Just rebound and get moving. Of course, the Holy Spirit never wants you to have a guilt complex. So the true manifestation of love from a pastor teacher is study and teach, study and teach, study and teach. It's not flattery. And it's definitely not setting up fun and games. That's all a bunch of distraction. Fun and games is fine outside of church. Galatians 4.19 Galatians 4.19 My little children... My little children. Now, Paul's not really being insulting here. What he's saying is, remember, I'm the one who led you to the Lord. You're my little children. I led you to the Lord. So Paul says, my little children. Now, the best translation we could get next is, I am sweating you out. And I say it's the best translation because it's an idiom. Literally, it means Paul is under birth pains. Paul is under labor. And of course, Paul can't be. It just refers to extreme pressure, extreme agony. So the best way to put it instead of I'm having you as a baby, it should be I am sweating you out until until here, until here introduces a future future temporal clause. And that means it hasn't happened yet. So again, my little children, Paul led them to the Lord. I am sweating you out. He's very concerned about them. Until Christ is formed in you. What's that mean? We all know that when we believe in Christ, Christ is already in us. So what does it mean to have Christ formed in you? Well, Christ is already in us. This is just a different way of describing the unique spiritual life. And what Paul is telling them, I'm sweating you out until Christ is formed in you. And this means until you begin to represent the essence of Christ, the thinking of Christ. And the only way to get there is by the things we've noted over and over again. The two power options the three spiritual skills, the, the uh, four spiritual mechanics, which include the ten problem-solving devices, and the execution of the three stages of the adult spiritual life. And the Apostle Paul is telling them, I am sweating you out. I'm going to teach you until you understand all these things, is what he's saying. And he's saying, here you are going in for legalism. And he's saying, I'm very concerned about that because you'll never get even close to this unless you start being filled with the Spirit. And the only way Christ is formed in you is to be filled with the Spirit, to utilize Operation Z, to grow in grace and in knowledge, and to execute the unique spiritual life. 
So what is the true love of a pastor? Study and teach, study and teach, study and teach. It is not flattery. It is not visiting you when you have problems because guess what? If you've been learning the Word of God, you'll be able to sort them problems out on your own. You'll begin to understand the faith rest drill and sort them out on your own. Besides, when you start telling a pastor all your problems, it becomes a problem for the pastor because any time he comes up and preaches on a subject related to the problem you've had, you think, oh no, he's picking on me. And that's another reason why it has to be taught in a group to maintain privacy so that you know, well, he's not really picking on me. He's just hitting a subject that hurts me. And that's the best way to do it. That doesn't mean we can't have a social life altogether. It just means I don't need to know about your problems. Because if I know about your problems and then I have to come across that problem and teach it in Scripture, you will say, Oh, that's all about me and he's being personal. No, it's in the Bible. The Bible's being personal with all of us. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we've noted related to the Galatians so that we might not follow in their footsteps. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.